When it comes to premium luxury, it seems as though the German manufacturers have had a stranglehold on the market. But what if you want something just a bit different, a bit more special? That's where this comes in, the new 2022 Range Rover. This fifth generation model just got a complete redesign and it looks to build upon Land Rover's heritage of opulence and adventure. Over the course of this review, we'll cover everything you need to know, from how it drives to its interior and every little perk or drawback in between. Before we get into that, do us a favor, hit those like and subscribe buttons below to stay up to date with all of our latest reviews. Also remember, you can sell your car 100% online at cargurus.com. You'll get the best offer from thousands of dealers. We'll send someone to pick it up and get you paid. It really couldn't be any easier. From the outside, the new 2022 Range Rover looks a lot like its predecessor. From the front, there's not a lot to tell the difference since the headlights look almost identical. The lower grille is now rectangular rather than U-shaped though. One of the most recognizable traits for this new generation is this trim element under the mirrors. There are double vertical strip here, but the last generation continued rearward at the bottom. Otherwise, the profile is much the same. A lot of other large vehicles attempt to mask their size with clever body sculpting to visually slim them down. Not the Range Rover. No, Land Rover has leaned into the mass with broad expanses of unadorned sheet metal that really emphasize its presence. And it definitely has presence because this is the long wheelbase model with three rows of seats. Around back, the styling has been greatly simplified and modernized. The traditional square taillights have been replaced by these LED strips hidden away in the integrated liftgate trim. To me, it's a more harmonious design overall. But what do you think? Has the Range Rover gotten too soft and futuristic? Let us know in the comments below. The new Range Rover is currently offered with a choice of two engines. This has the base P400 engine, which is a turbocharged three liter six cylinder that makes 395 horsepower and 406 pound feet of torque. It also has a mild hybrid component to help fuel efficiency. Shoppers can upgrade to the P530, which goes with a turbocharged 4.4 liter V8 that produces 523 horsepower and 553 pound feet of torque. Both engines are paired with an eight speed automatic transmission and all wheel drive is standard. For 2023, a P440E model will be added, which is a plug-in hybrid. It's rated at 434 horsepower, and Land Rover claims you can get 48 miles of electric-only range before switching to gasoline. Initially, it'll only be offered in the regular wheelbase models. The big news comes in the 2024 model year, when a fully electric variant should debut. There's not a lot of information on that yet, so keep checking back at cargurus.com for all the latest developments. As is the case with all Land Rovers, this Range Rover isn't just meant for exploring the swanky urban environments. It has an impressive amount of off-road abilities that will likely exceed what most owners would consider sensible. Normally, I'd jump at the chance to demonstrate its all-terrain skills, but I'd prefer not to call Land Rover telling them that I scuffed up their optional $3,800 23-inch wheels. We'll keep this one on the pavement this time. And speaking of the road, let's hop in for a quick spin. Off the line, this six-cylinder Range Rover gathers speed effortlessly. Land Rover claims it'll reach 60 miles an hour in only 5.8 seconds, which is impressive for an SUV that weighs almost 6,000 pounds. Acceleration is smooth and nearly uninterrupted. It's easy to mistake it for a V8 until you press the pedal harder and then you hear that V6 hum. Getting up to speed is a piece of cake from a stop, but passing slower traffic on the highway takes a little more effort. I had to floor the pedal to get the transmission to downshift and give me sufficient power, and even then, I kinda had to plan ahead. The brakes, well, they're great at getting the behemoth slowed down, and the pedal has a good amount of firmness that instills confidence. As a premium luxury vehicle, it's also easy to come to a nice smooth limo stop. Normally, we wouldn't expect much in terms of handling, but this Range Rover exceeds expectations. It's settled and well-mannered in the turns, despite the weight and tall ride height. Body roll is well-managed, but you're not encouraged to explore the performance potential. Now, if you're seeking sharper handling, 
the Range Rover Sport may be a better alternative. And that leads me to ride comfort. This may be the best I've experienced among all premium luxury SUVs. Better than BMW, Mercedes, or Audi. It really smooths over all of the road imperfections, providing one of the calmest in-cabin drives ever. Adding to that refined isolation is a distinct lack of road or wind noise. It's quiet as a crypt in here, and it really allows the audio to really shine. Despite the massive footprint, this Range Rover is surprisingly maneuverable. Huh? Four-wheel steering is standard, and it allows you to turn about much sharper than you'd expect. Using the available automated parking system, I crammed this SUV into a parallel spot that was barely big enough. If you're one of the rare owners with plans for all-terrain adventures, that kind of maneuverability certainly comes in handy on narrow trails. Overall, this Range Rover is very enjoyable to drive, and I can see myself comfortably cruising all day on a road trip. But that's only part of the overall experience. The interior is equally critical. So let's do a deep dive on that next. You might think I'm weird for saying this, but this Range Rover smells amazing. The abundance of rich leather upholstery gives it a real upmarket scent. It's sort of like a prohibitively expensive handbag or really expensive pair of Oxfords, not brogues. So yeah, maybe I'm a little weird for saying that it is so good to smell. As a woodworking enthusiast, I'm also a huge fan of this open pore silver birch wood trim. It looks really great. It adds a lot of warmth. Plus, it just feels great to the touch. The dash is fairly minimal, and I like its simplicity. It has these vents that are tucked into the very top of the dash, and this 13-inch infotainment touchscreen adds a nice dose of modernity. I'd personally prefer if the screen was mounted just a little bit higher because as it is, it's just a little too low and might be a little more distracting while you're driving. The new PV Pro infotainment system is a huge step forward. It's much better than previous generations. It has sharp graphics and overall, it has a nice luxury vibe to it. After just a few minutes of getting acquainted, I found it easy and intuitive to use. I'm also glad that they gave us some physical buttons and controls here for climate control. I also really like these dials here that allow you to just push it and it gives you access to seat temperature so you can turn on the ventilation or heating. As expected, materials quality is excellent and there's a satisfying heft to its overall construction. Really, the only way to do better would be to step up to a Bentley or Maybach. Outward visibility is also worth pointing out because you have an expansive view. You have a lot of glass for these windows and these roof pillars are positioned in a way where they don't block your view. On a sunny day, these dual sun visors really come in handy and effectively block almost all glare. The front seats are generously padded for long distance comfort. It's almost like a big comfy hug. There are no hard points, but there are plenty of adjustments to make sure you get the optimal driving position. These seats are further optioned with a massage function that's actually pretty aggressive in the seat back. It's almost like one of those kind of knuckle shiatsu massages. It really works you out. There's also plenty of space for your personal items. You have these split level glove boxes here. You also have this tray here that's rubberized and has a wireless phone charger. Then you have your cup holders here and underneath those, they slide away for an even deeper bin here and also some USB charge ports. Then of course you have this massive capacious bin here where, hello, yeah, you can squeeze a lot of stuff in there. Combine that with some well-sized door pockets, you're gonna have plenty of space for your stuff. Of course, no review would be complete without me nitpicking something, and in this case, it's this metal surround around the gear selector. In midday lighting conditions, it can cause a lot of nasty reflections that just sear your retinas. So if I had the choice, and unfortunately there isn't a choice, I'd actually extend that open pore wood trim all the way through it. As far as complaints go, that's about as minor as it gets. So let's check out the second row. Here in the second row, I have an abundance of space. Taller six-footers 
would be more than happy back here. You have sliding and reclining seats that are power adjustable. And you also have your own climate controls here with controls for the heating and ventilation of the outboard seats. Right underneath, you have two USB-C ports here, as well as a household power outlet. Power sunshades are also available. And you also have separate controls here for the overall sunshade from the sunroof, as well as controls for the other side door. Accessing the third row is done by touch of a button right here, but it does take a few seconds for it to execute. Once out of the way, you have this nice pass-through to access the third row. You also have controls here to slide the middle row back towards you. Now, I'm five foot 10, and yeah, my hair is just barely brushing the headliner, but I do have a decent amount of space. I have a good amount of knee room, plus these seats are kind of pushed back, and plenty of space for my feet underneath. One thing I'm also really pleased with is I have a decent amount of thigh support, which is kind of unusual for a third row. A lot of times they're mounted a lot lower so you get more headroom, but this seems to work for at least a moderately sized adult. You also have a USB port here to keep your devices charged, as well as heated seats. Back here we have a hands-free power lift gate, as well as the lower section, which is a Range Rover staple. I personally like it because if you have sports equipment or groceries back here and you're parked on an incline, it keeps things from rolling down the hill. Behind the third row of seats, we have 17.1 cubic feet of cargo space, and that's not a whole lot. So that's something you wanna keep in mind if you have a packed road trip. Loading is further helped by this adjustable air suspension here that drops it down to make loading bulkier and heavier objects that much easier. You also have power controls to lower the rear seats. It takes a while, but it's really nice that you don't have to crawl in and hit some latches and push things down. Another bonus, this lower section here makes it so when you are loading stuff in, you're not gonna dirty up the front of your slacks on the back of the bumper. Now, when you do fold these seats flat, that gives you 43.1 cubic feet. And when you fold the second row flat, 93 cubic feet. That's some pretty serious cargo, even though I doubt most people are gonna load it that much. This 2022 Range Rover is one of the most luxurious SUVs you can get. It easily surpasses the expectations set by the already lofty German brands, but it comes at a price. It starts around $106,000 and climbs to $220,000 for the long wheelbase SV model. This particular one with options rings in just over $130,000. The Mercedes GLS starts just under 80 grand, but the off-road capable G-Wagon will set you back $140,000 to start. BMW's X7 also starts under $80,000, but doesn't have much in the way of off-road abilities. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the Bentley Bentayga and Maybach GLS that start above $160,000. None of these SUVs are very fuel efficient though. The EAPA estimates this Range Rover will only return 21 MPG in combined city and highway driving. And I have to say, I've never seen a gas gauge move as much during review like this. The forthcoming plug-in hybrid would be a better choice in this regard, plus it's more powerful, but we don't have fuel economy estimates yet. Personally, I'm more interested in the full electric 2024 model since EV off-roading feels more like hiking than motoring. What would you do if you had the money? Wait for the EV or stick with a plug-in hybrid or gas engines? Let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching and don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons. I'll see you next time, but in the meantime, I've got a fun gas station.